Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by Juniper Networks. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts, tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now, a quick word about our sponsor, Juniper Networks. NSS Labs gave Juniper its highest rating of recommended in its 2019 Data Center Security Gateway Test. To get your copy of the NSS Labs report, visit juniper.net slash secure DC or connect with Juniper on Twitter or Facebook. That's juniper.net slash secure DC. And we thank Juniper for making it possible to bring you Research Saturday. And thanks also to our sponsor, Enveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. So Latensphere is a browser which allows the user to masquerade in different ways. So in its easiest form, it allows the user to change some of the characteristics which make up the so-called fingerprint of the browser. That's Stefan Trouvé. He's the co-founder and chief technology officer at Recorded Future. The research we're discussing today is titled Profiling the Lincoln Sphere Anti-Detection Browser. Of course, the use for that is that uh, if you're connecting from the same machine and trying to sort of have different personalities, different identities, you need to change these kinds of parameters. So that's one part of it. The other part of Lincoln Sphere is that it's a platform for essentially hiding that it's a machine and not a human that's communicating through the browser. Hmm. Examples of how you can do that, for example, is uh, if you do text input, it will it has the capacity to change the timing so it looks like a human typing and not a machine putting in information, for example. It can also change between appearing to be a normal, say, laptop-based browser and a touchscreen-based browser. And so what's the background in terms of the origin of, uh, of this? Where, where did it come from? Who developed it? So this has been around for a couple of years now, developed by what we assume is, is a Russian guy who did this. And uh, the reason we decided to do some deeper dive into it now and, and explore its capabilities was that, they, was that they released a new version this summer. So we thought it was interesting to see you know, what kind of new features they have put in there and, and also what the community using it we're, we're talking about. So we've been tracking it both through the developer's own website, things like that, but also by looking in various criminal forums and seeing what kind of discussions are going on there, what are people asking about and, you know, essentially how, how well supported is the product. Now, as is the case with many of these tools that have uh, you know, multiple uses on both sides of the fence, the the developers here list a number of legitimate uses for it. What, what sorts of things are they saying that are the, the legitimate uh, reasons for having a tool like this? Well, you know, so they are saying that this can be used for penetration testing. It can be used uh, if you're testing your system, you know. So we're actually using some similar tools ourselves when we develop our own user interfaces. Uh, it can also be used, uh, they claim, for for privacy. You know, if you want to, if you're, say, working in an environment where you are afraid of, say, government or someone else intervening with you, you know, that you can get higher privacy through this. And these are all le- legitimate cases, you know. Those are, all, those are all good cases why people in different situations could want a tool like this. But then, of course, you know, as we've been writing about you could also find a number of not quite as legitimate uses for it. Well, well, let's go through your research here. I mean, what what are some of the key things that you all were looking at? We really did this as a product evaluation, you can say. So we started out by checking out the pricing and uh, the kind of support you get. And I would say the overall conclusion on that side is that this is a very 
professional organization providing this, you know, so they they are very open about their license terms. You can license a light and a pro and a premium version. You can have it for different times. And they're very clear about what kind of capabilities you get from different uh, with the different licenses. So in that sense, it all looks like a very legitimate product, you know, good support. Also appears from uh, the way they are answering questions about it, that they have a good customer support organization. You know, people ask things, they both reply themselves, and there's a community of users who reply on, on questions about how to use it and how to set it up and so on. The pricing uh, starts at $100 per month. I, I suppose, I mean, that sits it somewhere in there where uh, it's not out of reach for a lot of people, but I, I can't imagine that it's something that, uh, that an amateur would be willing to pay for as well. No, you're quite right. This is not something which people would sort of, you know, you wouldn't throw out that money just for fun. So you should have a legitimate economic case for, for paying that kind of license fee. Absolutely. Now, your research here, you go through uh, quite a bit of detail in your threat analysis. Can you walk through some of the the interesting things that you found here? The first part is, is really the way it allows you to hide in, in different ways. So first of all, we should say, you know, that this is based on Chromium. Uh, but of course, they've stripped out anything which calls back, for example, to Google services and, and so on. So when you're using this, you could feel secure that you will not be tracked. There are no tracking mechanisms that we have found, at least in the product as such. Um, hmm. and, and then the first part maybe, you know, is that you can, as I said, you, you can use that to essentially configure what your profile will look like, you know, what operating system, what browser, what kind of machine, time zone, and so on, which you can do, which you appear to be coming from when you use this. So very handy. And you can think of one reason you want to do that is, for example, if you want to, let's say, you know, go to the same website multiple times with short time in between and not appear to come from the same machine, then that's excellent because you can then set up so you have a new profile every time you go there. Uh, a use case for that, for example, could be if, you know, let's say that you you want, you're want in the business of trying to manipulate, say, customer ratings, for example. You know, you could very easily using this tool, you could go to something like TripAdvisor or something like that, you know, a hundred times and, and put in new reviews and it will look like it's different individuals putting in those reviews. So that would be one, one simple use case for, for that hmm. functionality. And it has the ability to automate that, right? It's fairly uh, easy to to spin up those, to, I guess, to randomize those those uh, those settings. Yes, it has the ability. It's essentially, and, and what you get is that you get even with a subscription, you you get a bunch of settings. You know, so you get a bunch of profiles from scratch, but you can also add your own. Hmm. So that's very very simple. And the other interesting thing, which I think is maybe the most interesting part, is that apart from being able to do this manually or semi-manually, there is also an API which you can use with Lincoln Sphere. So through the API, you could uh, have a, a script, you know, it could be a simple shell script or it could be a, a program which connects to the API and, and, you know, does very high volume accessing, for example. So you could imagine if you have accessed, say, leaked credentials from a website, you know, let's say you have a few thousand or hundreds of thousands of credentials for a website. And when you want to look through those to check which ones are actually valid, which you can get access with, then you could write a little program which would go through this API, have a new profile every time, and then try to get in there and you will record that. So it's a, it's a great platform, if you like, for validating those kind of things. So in terms of, of it being successful, in doing what it sets out to do, in other words, this is a difficult thing to circumvent. It, it, it uh, it's successful in making you appear as though you're coming from the, the things it's pretending, the, the, the settings that it's uh, sort of randomizing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I think, you know, it's, uh, as we say, it, it's extremely hard to to has put any new kind of defense. I mean, if you look at the kind of ways that, for example, in e-commerce, or some, something that would try to defend against, against someone coming with, you know, doing multiple logins, for example, the, one of the few tools you have there is looking at the originating IP address or this kind of browser profiling. And since uh, Linkus here can connect through a Tor network, for example, you know, it would be very hard or possible even to, to track the IP address. In combination with the fake fingerprinting, it would be virtually impossible 
to defend against that kind of tool when you use when someone's using it. Our thanks to Stefan Trouvé for joining us. The research is titled Profiling the Lincoln Sphere Anti-Detection Browser. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to Juniper Networks for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at juniper.net slash security or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. And thanks to Envail for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envail.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Kim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. <laughs>